Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme related documents carefully. Today we have a very interesting topic. So whether you like it or not, I still call it interesting. And you'll know in a bit why I say so. Uh, as we have been doing in the past few sessions, let's let's first look at a clip from uh, the Berkshire meeting this year, and we'll discuss it. Further. Okay, station two. Good afternoon, Mr. Buffett and Mr. Munger. I'm John Gorey from Iowa City, Iowa. When interest rates go from zero to negative in a country, how does that change the way that you value a company or a stock? Do you choose a high valuation because the discount rate is, high, is low? Or on the other hand, do you choose a low valuation because the cash flow is likely to be poor? Well, going from, which we haven't done in this country yet, but going from zero to minus a half is really no different than going from four to three and a half. Or, I mean, it, it, it has a different feel to it, obviously, if you, if you, if you uh, have to pay a half a point to somebody. But if you, if you have your yield or your base rate reduced by half a point, uh, it's of some significance, but it isn't dramatic. What's dramatic is interest rates being where they are generally. I mean, whether it's zero, plus a quarter, minus a quarter, plus a half, minus a half, we are dealing with a situation that's essentially very close to zero interest rates, and we have been for a long time and longer than I would have anticipated. The, the nature of it is that you'll pay more for a business uh, when interest rates are zero than if they were like 15% when Volcker was around. and, and and you can take that up and down the line. I mean, it, uh, we don't get too exact about it because it isn't that exact a science. But very cheap money makes me pay a little more for businesses than when money was at what we previously thought was normal rates. And very tight money would cause me to pay somewhat less. I mean, uh, you know, the we had a rule for 2,600 years that uh, Aesop lived around 600 BC, but he didn't happen to know it was BC, but you know, he can't know everything. The, uh, uh, and it was that a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, but a bird in the hand now is worth about nine tenths of a bird in the bush in, in Europe, you know, because it depends on how far out the bush is, but it keeps getting worth less as you go along. So these are very unusual times that way. And if you ask me, whether I paid a little more for precision cash parts because interest rates were around zero than if they'd been 6%, the answer is yes. I try not to pay too much more, but it has an effect. Uh, and uh, if interest rates continue at this rate for a long time, if people ever really start thinking something close to this is normal, that will have an enormous effect on asset values. It already has some effect. Charlie? Yeah, but I don't think anybody really knows much about negative interest rates. We never had them before. And and we never had periods of stasis, like 20, except for the Great Depression. We, we didn't have things like happened in Japan. Great modern nation playing all the monetary tricks, Keynesian tricks, stimulus tricks, and mired in stasis for 25 years. And none of the great economists who studied this stuff and taught it to our children understand it either. So we just do the best we can. And they still don't understand it. No. And there are advantages that we know we don't understand it. It's really, it's interesting though. I mean, we are, you know, it's, it's, it makes for an interesting movie. It, uh, and it does modestly affect what we pay for businesses, uh, whether, I don't think anybody expected it to last this long, do you, Charlie? Personally? I don't think, everybody, if you're not confused, you haven't thought about it correctly. <laughs> yeah. I thought about it correctly then. Uh, so that's the reason I call today's presentation an interesting presentation, got nothing to do with whether I am interesting or not, it's because we will be talking interest rates.
So there are many highlights in this short clip. One of them is that he has said clearly that when rates are low, we pay higher for businesses, stocks, whatever. This was an interesting point. So if ever people start thinking that these kind of rates, zero, plus half, minus half, these kind of rates are normal rates, then it will have a huge, huge impact on asset valuations. As of now, it has had some impact, but if this were to become normal, then there will be a tremendous impact. Again, uh, Munger in his typical style said, no one knows about negative interest rates because we have never had them before. And people who teach economics to our children or who are great economists themselves don't know about it. He says, the advantage that we have is that we know we do not know. Other people are ignorant about this. And he says, if you are not confused, then you haven't thought about the problem correctly. So in the past, there have been many bubbles in financial markets and then bubbles burst. And each time there's a bubble, people say this time it's different. And typically people talk about bubbles only after they have burst. So after the burst of the new economy or TMT or IC, whatever you call in the year 2000-2001, people said, oh, we knew all along. In 2008-2009, people said, oh, we knew all along uh, real estate was risky, uh, subprime was risky and so on. Very few people even attempt to make a real-time call saying, we are right now in a bubble. So let's make that attempt today. Is something crazy going on in the world of bonds, in the world of fixed income securities? Let's look at what is probably one of the biggest bubble, if it is, of all times. Thirteen trillion worth of bonds in the global market trade at negative yields. So one billion is six thousand seven hundred crore of rupees. One trillion is sixty-seven lakh crore of rupees, and thirteen times that in rupee terms. So this is the amount if we were to put in rupee terms. This is the amount of worth of bonds trading at negative interest rates. That is, you pay the borrower for him to borrow from you. That borrower can be anyone. It can be a government or it can be a bank or whoever. And this is, mind you, only bonds trading at negative yields. We are not talking about bonds trading at 0.10%, 0.2%, 0.35%. No. This amount is bonds trading at a negative yield. We are not talking about low interest bearing bonds. And we have never had these before. So the first question is, what is it right now that has caused interest rates to be so low and for so long and mind you this is not a blip so sometimes crazy crazy things happen in the financial markets so there is a error in punching an order in the trading terminal and suddenly stock prices crash and they bounce back in a matter of minutes or sometimes there may be some geopolitical event which causes a spike for a week, 10 days, and again things turn back to normal. 
We are not talking about a temporary dislocation in the market. Today, Swiss bonds as far out as 50 years trade at negative yields. So many European countries have bonds trading at negative yields as far out as 10 years, 20 years. So it's not a blip, it's not a short term phenomenon. And again, Japan has had low interest rates for a very, very long time. So why has this come about? Whenever someone is in a lot of pain or recovering from a surgery or whatever, that patient is given sedatives. One reason for low interest rates has been that everyone was in pain after events in 2008, Lehman Brothers bankruptcy, Bear Sons, Merrill Lynch getting taken over and so on. There was a risk to the global financial system, there was a risk to the world economy. Central banks went out and cut interest rates dramatically. So that was, if I like opium being given to a patient to ease the pain, but sometimes these sedatives or painkillers create addiction. So probably we have not been able to wean away the global economy from low interest rates and high liquidity. What started as a safeguard measure, safety measure to prevent financial system from collapsing then became competitive. So there was low growth, zero growth. Everyone said let me gain at the expense of others. If I devalue my currency, my exports will prosper imports to my country will go down so let me devalue and everyone started doing that using one tool of interest rates and that has led to this competitive devaluation situation so everything can devalue simultaneously because everything is relative to each other which is the second reason why we are in the situation where we are The third thing is more systemic and this has been in evidence in Japan and in Europe. So typically borrowing happens at the early stage of a career of a person. When a person achieves graduation or some professional qualification etc. and that person is starting out in life, that person will have tendency to prepone consumption. That person will borrow money for a vehicle loan, borrow money for a housing loan and repay it later. So there is lot of demand for money. That demand for money keeps interest rates somewhat higher. But as the population ages, elderly people, they want to invest in fixed income securities which give them regular return. They don't want to borrow money for a car loan or a housing loan. They are suppliers of capital rather than consumers of capital. And even otherwise as population is aging, as growth is down, if growth is not there, people will not put up more factories, people, businesses will not invest too much money in that economy. So this is a more structural factor in some of the developed countries. Another reason is to kick the can down the road. If there is a problem today, no politician wants to face it. Every politician is in office for 4 years, 5 years, 8 years, 10 years. Depending on 1 year, 2 or 1 term or 2 terms. They would rather have their successor deal with the problems rather than they themselves facing the problem up front. So today there are a lot of countries which have their financial system in a mess. Uh, earlier there was this acronym, PIGS, Portugal, Ireland, Italy, Greece and Spain. At that time these countries were considered bankrupt countries. But when you extend the maturity and when you provide them with low interest rates, essentially it's free money, you can repay whenever you want. We will keep postponing the due date. 
So it's, it will be surprising for many that today uh, yields on uh, Italian bonds or whatever are at negative yields. So a country which was considered bankrupt, some of the pigs countries have two-year bonds at negative rates. Uh, which is surprising when uh, even a country like India, which no one considers bankrupt, which has good amount of forex reserves and all, we pay a fairly high interest rate, but some of these European countries are at negative yields. So we have seen how this came about. The question is, why is it prevailing for a long period of time? Typically when an anomaly comes about, there are people, smart people in the financial markets who are there to take advantage of the opportunity. Let us say the price on BSE and NSC has a 5% difference. There will be people who will buy on the exchange with lower prices and sell on the exchange with higher prices. An anomaly cannot exist in the market for a very very long period of time. But in the fixed income markets, the trouble is that the people who could have possibly taken advantage of the situation, people like banks, themselves have broken balance sheets. They have no appetite for any kind of risk whatsoever. Again, uh, a trivia, market cap of a Kotak Mahindra bank today is more than the market cap of Deutsche Bank in Germany, the largest bank in Germany. People are not trusting the financials of these large banks. They are so excessively leveraged and they are in fact in the process of cutting down the risk on their balance sheets. So they are not in a position to say that okay, uh, interbank rates are negative or if uh, 10 year bonds in Europe are negative, we will borrow money there and we will go out in search of higher yields. The intermediaries are not strong enough today. That is one reason why it is prevailing and it could prevail for a while. Again, uh, in the US, we have seen that people with the most propensity to consume have burned their hands in the last cycle. So all the subprime borrowers have seen a near bankruptcy kind of situation or could not repay their uh, borrowings and have had their credit scores coming down and so on. So they are not in the mood to borrow. In fact, a lot of people have been curbing their credit card usage and have been using more of debit cards in the US. So the borrowers are also not there. And we have seen aging population again, that is a structural thing. Those people will not want to borrow. So then we come to this question, are negative interest rates in the current scenario logical? Our person has said that a positive interest rate or a positive rate, on, rate of return on capital is like what heaven and hell is to religion. A religion cannot exist without the concept of heaven and hell, same way capitalism is built on the foundation of a positive return on capital. You cannot have capitalism if you say that give me capital but I will not give you anything in return or I will return back less than what I have borrowed from you. So clearly there is something which is amiss in the current scenario. So just when we ask ourselves the question, is it logical? Is it logical for the bank to charge you money to keep money in the current account or a savings account? Like would people do it on a sustainable basis? You could probably go out and withdraw money from the bank and keep the cash in the mattress. So it is clearly illogical. Again, we have seen virtually bankrupt countries again borrowing at negative rates. So in capitalism there is or in bonds there is something called default risk. If you consider that there is a 5% probability that this company or this government will default then you add that much 
risk premium to the interest rate. But here, a virtually bankrupt country is borrowing at negative rates. I mentioned this about capitalism. So if something cannot continue forever, that will eventually stop. So we, we have seen that banks are today not in a position to arbitrage or a lot of players have constraints. But ultimately, money has to find its own level. Money has to get deployed into something which will give a positive real rate of return adjusted for the risk that is taken by the lender or the investor. So let's see how some of those things could play out in the marketplace. So when I did accountancy or when I did commerce, we were taught about cash discount. If you purchase something on credit, you have to pay more ultimately and if you pay upfront cash, you pay less. Now when yields started becoming negative, what people started doing is, people started paying upfront. I will give you advance against my telephone bill, advance electricity. If I purchase from someone, I will give cash payment instead of borrowing money. So it turns everything on its head. So what people will do is that entire credit in the system will go away. People will start paying upfront. That is one way about where people go about getting away from the negative yields. Cash under the mattress. I already spoke about it. There are some banks who are thinking about this that rather than deploy money in the money market at negative yields, we will create these huge vaults where we will withdraw cash from the central bank and we will put that cash and we will employ security guards around that vault. It's cheaper to do that rather than put money in the money markets. Again, think about it. If you had a zero interest rate mortgage or a home loan or if you had a negative interest rate on a home loan you could effectively say I'll pay you after 500 years and after 500 years your liability would be zero because negative yield would have gone on accumulating on that. So again it is something completely illogical and all sorts of strange things will start happening. So one place where I respectfully Disagree with Buffett, what Buffett said. Buffett said that interest rate falling from let's say 4 to 3 is the same as interest rate falling from positive half to negative half. But I think negative changes the direction. It Money can be cheap, money can be expensive depending on the stage of the business cycle. But you cannot, can never logically have a situation where the borrower is to be paid money to borrow money from you. That is a sea change. That is a heaven versus hell kind of situation. It's not a question of grading. It's not a question of level of the cost of funds. It's a direction. So when the direction becomes opposite, a lot of strange behavior will manifest itself. Again, this hasn't gone on long enough for a lot of these things to really come into being in a big way. But you could see some of these. So how will money chase returns? So just imagine yourself in the position of a manager who manages retirement funds or endowments in these developed countries. Every month people save out of their salaries and give money to you saying please invest this money for my future and all bonds are giving you negative yields. What will these people do? So one of the avenues where they could go is they could go for things like real assets. So we will discuss that. Banks 
So when I am saying money will chase returns, even if banks today have broken balance sheets, even if banks today are not able to arbitrage or channelize funds into positive yielding assets, finally the bank's depositors or the investors who invest with banks or who buy bonds, the underlying investors will move away from these avenues. They will themselves take it upon themselves to go and chase assets and we have seen this in Japan in the past. When interest rates fell to a very low level, Japanese citizens themselves started going abroad and chasing yields and assets. Think about sovereign wealth funds. So, say you are Raghuram Rajan or if you are the central banker of China or if you are in charge of the Norwegian or some Middle Eastern sovereign wealth fund, if you are a central banker or a sovereign wealth fund, you are running balance sheets of hundreds of billions of dollars. Just imagine the position of someone sitting in RBI who has to manage our 300, 350 billion dollars and all these yields are negative. So far they haven't be become too adventurous. But somewhere they will try to do something. So one of the reasons why sovereign wealth funds came into being is the reserves were becoming far too large. So they said rather than keep it in currencies, we will put it in sovereign wealth fund and then go out and look for assets, either entire companies or corporate bonds or what not. So one of the reasons why sovereign wealth funds came into being is a lot of these money had to be channelized. So today you are seeing a situation where the Chinese government would be happy to own entire corporations in US or in some other countries or maybe buying some mining companies or what not rather than own treasuries. Think about corporates. If you are a cash rich company like let's say the Bajaj group or if you are Apple incorporated with maybe 250-300 billion dollars of cash. What would you do as a corporate treasurer in such a world? So we will look at what corporates could do in detail going forward but again so far corporates who were deploying money with banks who would not be hassled with chasing yields they were just giving money to the banks saying okay give me 4% 5% but today when banks are charging for or banks will charge for money being kept with them corporates will go out and hunt for yields themselves. Let's look at where the search for yield will take us. <coughs> Just imagine that you are a CFO of a company with no borrowings. You don't have cash reserves, you don't have debt. You are just neck and neck. Today, if money is available to you at close to zero and if you borrow just 50% of what your market cap is and if you do a share buyback, immediately your EPS doubles without any change in sales, any change in profit margins, any change in anything else because interest cost is not there. On your balance sheet, that much debt comes in which has to be repaid over many years and half of your equity shares go away because you have bought back half the shares. So this is just a thought experiment, not that too many corporates are able to access at zero, but many of them will eventually get money at 2%, 3%, 4% at very low interest rates. So share buybacks could be one avenue where money gets deployed and already in the US we are seeing a big impact of this. So rather than put up a new factory, put up manufacturing facilities, so many companies are going for uh, debt fueled share buybacks and that is one big reason why the markets have been strong. A lot of people are surprised why are US markets so rock solid, why are they going up over a period of time when economy is 
somewhat shaky the world over. But essentially, a lot of financial engineering is happening and the equity base is going down because of these buybacks. Again, finally, somewhere all of these people, sovereign wealth funds, uh, retirement funds, endowments, these people will have to look at equities because if equities are trading at let's say 20 times earnings, it effectively means that the equity share is giving you 5% earnings yield. Now a 5% earnings yield is not compatible with a 0% interest rate. Either one of them is wrong. So just again think about it. If money were to be available to you at 5% uh, at 0% and you could buy a 5% earnings yield asset. Effectively, if you borrow money for 20 years, all your principal amount will come from earnings itself and the asset will become free for you. So one of the two is incorrect and again as Buffett Munger say, if people start thinking that these kind of interest rates are normal, then it will have a severe impact on asset valuations. Junk bonds. So. Some people would get so frustrated with zero and negative rates that people will start investing with riskier and riskier borrowers. Ultimately, it will end badly, but in the interim, these bonds could be bid up to very high levels. This is a big thing that will happen. If you are sitting on billions of dollars in cash which is not giving you anything you won't mind buying companies at 20 times 30 times 40 times earnings and already we are seeing let's say as an example buy a group of germany wanting to buy monsanto so effectively when money is available freely valuations matter only at the fringe people say let's go out and deploy money rather than hold on to cash or if you have opportunity to borrow at low interest rates, a lot of people will say, why not? Why don't we become bigger? Why don't we acquire a lot of businesses? So a retirement fund or an endowment, if they are getting, let's say, 3% rental yield, theoretically, they should go out and buy the entire real estate in their country rather than giving money to uh, central banks. So although we have had a real estate bust in the last cycle, but again if people are forced to deploy money somewhere, real assets could again be an avenue. Asset leasing. So uh, at one of the presentations uh, by Mr. Ramdev Agarwal, he spoke about how Indigo Airlines is able to run an asset light balance sheet because aircraft lessers in these developed countries are willing to give leases at such low interest cost that it's always better to lease them rather than to either buy the assets out of equity or out of borrowings. So ultimately a lot of these people will start leasing construction equipment, aircrafts and what not. Utilities renewable energy so at zero interest rate putting up acres and acres of solar farms and things like that become very sensible so I don't know follow on bubbles where they will come but they could come in any of these places when 13 trillion dollar worth of money is floating around trying to find an avenue there could be one or more bubbles in any of these places So for any financial asset, the intrinsic value is, so for equity it's dividend, for any other asset, it's cash flow in year 1, year 2, year 3, discounted by the discounting factor. What strangely happens is, when let's say rate of return is 10%, so if R is 0.1, then intrinsic value is lower. If R becomes 5, 
इंटेंसिक वैल्यू गोज अप ड्रामेटिकली इफ दिस आर बिकम जीरो इन थियरी यू कैन पे एन इनफाइनाइट प्राइस फॉर एनी एसेट इफ यू डोंट एक्सपेक्ट एनी रिटर्न फ्रॉम वॉट यू आर इन्वेस्टिंग इन यू कैन पे एनी प्राइस हाउ डज इट मैटर एंड द क्रिएटर्स ऑफ दिस फॉर्मूला never envisage the situation where what would happen with negative rates so the formula is not equipped to give you answers for negative rates or at least no one has thought about it in that sense so again when they say if you are not confused you haven't thought about it uh, properly and again when he talks about that ace of fable where a bird in hand is worth Two in the bush. He says nowadays a bird in hand is worth nine tenths of a bird in bush, and if the bush is further away, it's even worth less. <coughs> so that is the confusing world that we live in. A lot of people keep harping on things like market cap to GDP ratio. Uh, global growth is not that high uh, asset values are high a lot of people are in fact waiting a crash is coming a crash is coming a crash is coming it's like the boy who keeps tying wolf but people who are saying a crash is coming are not taking into account the other part of the equation so people are very strongly focused on the numerator people are saying what is the earnings growth what is the cash flow what is the dividend but people are not talking about the huge debasement of currency that is happening the world over ultimately it will end end badly if it's not sustainable somewhere it has to end but in the interim things can go anywhere so the difficult thing and the correct thing to do would be to not be in uh, fizzy stocks or in uh, extreme high valuation stocks but to hang on to businesses which are reasonably valued not to be in a hurry to stay on cash and to await the crash because that crash may not happen for next 1 2 3 5 years you don't know how long this money printing money pumping uh, liquidity floating around will continue some signs we have already seen so uh, if you read stories on bloomberg cnbc or some of the international press they are already talking about uh, how bonds in india make a lot of sense uh, some of the foreign brokers are encouraging their clients to buy indian bonds so indian bond giving you seven quarter interest rate and even if you do a currency hedge which will say cost which will cost you let's say 5 and 1/2% or whatever 6% still it's a hugely positive interest rate even after a currency hedge whereas people are buying bonds of bankrupt countries at negative yields so you could see a frenzy even for fixed income assets in india we are, we are seeing the early stages of a rupee denominated bond market what is in the international uh, scenario what is referred to as masala bonds uh, hdfc already has come out with uh, one issue of that you could see uh, some of the money coming in to fund a lot of infrastructure assets so i think we are in a sweet position today where commodity prices are low global growth is low interest rates are low credibility of india is at a reasonable level so we can actually go out and fund a lot of our projects so people keep talking about this uh, mumbai ahmedabad bullet train and should we do it should we not do it Uh, will the money be better spent elsewhere and so on but what people don't realize is that it's being funded at virtually zero interest rate it's at 
something like half a percent interest rate or something thereabouts and 30 year plus kind of uh, borrowing funded by the Japanese. So essentially uh, it's a time where if we do things properly, if we grab the opportunity, we could have a scenario where we can fund a lot of infrastructure spend be it on uh, roads, highways, railways, airports, uh, what not by uh, these kind of borrowings. This kind of scenario could also be a lifeline to some of the infrastructure players who have operational assets. Their bad projects will no one can revive but already we are seeing uh, let's say uh, this Prem Vatsa's company taking a stake in one of the uh, operational airport projects. A lot of people want to buy existing operational road, toll road projects uh, for fixed income returns that they can get. So those kind of things are also happening. Uh, so there is a Chinese uh, curse which says may you live in interesting times. So I think we are in those interesting times. So thank you. This is what I wanted to share today. Happy to take questions and comments. It, the momentum has been building up last couple of years. It started off as uh, interest rate cutting, keep going, going to z close to zero. The negative thing has really started off late. And all major developed economies, uh, USA and the European, the Japanese. US is not in negative territory. Uh, US is in positive territory. Uh, most European countries are in negative space. Japan is. Switzerland is. UK, there is talk that it might go that way. The UK is still not there, but th there is a possibility. Uh, so that's a very interesting point that you make. Uh, one of the arguments in favor of negative rates is that today if $100 can buy you something and if it is anticipated that one year from now you will be able to borrow, buy the same good or service for $98 then maybe interest rates should, should be minus 2% in a deflationary kind of scenario. The issue with that is that in a fiat money kind of situation or in the world of currency, when you impose negative rates on anybody, that person can withdraw cash from the bank and store cash in the home. That person is not forced to keep money in the bank. So to my mind, logically zero should be the hard floor. If you go below zero, then all kinds of strange behaviors can crop up. And taken to the extreme, then the whole economy will come to a standstill. Then you will not consume anything today except for your groceries and items of daily consumption without which you cannot do. You will always anticipate a lower price very soon. Then people will keep postponing consumption. There will be losses to businesses, job losses to the workforce and so on, bankruptcies and so on. So in India the situation is not as divergent as we spoke about in the developed countries. In the developed countries we said interest rates close to zero, earnings yield on stocks let's say 5%. In India you do not have that situation. So in India uh, 
10 years GSA could be let's say seven quarter or tax free bonds would be wherever six and a half or whatever is the prevailing uh, yield. Company FDs or some NBFC FDs nine nine and a half percent. Is it a good time to lock in? Uh, definitely a good time to lock in if you believe that we will be responsible in terms of uh, keeping inflation under control at levels close to where they are. So currently we have a good amount of positive yield and I do see uh, money flowing into India if this situation continues for a long time that ultimately people will want avenues to deploy money and good quality Indian credit will find it easy to attract money. So it may be a good time to lock into rates. Only caveat is if globally we move towards tightening somewhere let's say 2 years, 3 years, 5 years out and if you have locked your interest rates for 20 years and we start seeing the return of inflation, the return of higher interest rates, then you could see capital losses. Near term, looking at the way things are, Indian fixed income market is very attractive from a global perspective. So equity in India, I would be hesitant in making a broad sweep comment. Uh, in the last year or two, we have seen a big run up in some of the small and mid cap stocks. Some of the stocks are trading at very, very high valuations. We have discussed in one of the past uh, uh, sessions that we have had. So if you are feeling un uncomfortable with the valuations, surely one should exit. Uh, some of the cyclicals which have seen a good bounce, so things like PSU banks have run up quite a bit. Again, I think improvements in fundamentals will take quite some time. It's not that overnight things will become better for them. Uh, global commodities, things like steel and all will have pain for quite some time. It's not that recovery will come easy. So some of those you could exit, but otherwise uh, if the fundamentals are okay, if valuations are not too stretched, uh, growth is coming in, margins are under control, then you can continue holding on. I don't see uh, a broad sweep uh, problem. That's a hypothetical example. You have 50 lakhs worth of nest shares and you have 50 lakhs at 8.5% tax free bonds. And now you have to buy a house worth 50 lakhs. What do you sell? Do you sell the nest or the tax free bonds or how? So, again, in the Indian context, I don't think today there is a clear answer to these asset class decisions. If we were talking about, let's say, a European country, I would definitely say sell all your government bonds and buy Nestle, the Swiss company. I don't think there is any confusion that I have as far as the Swiss Nestle goes. In India, a lot of the consumption names are quoting at very high valuations. So I am a bit uh, cautious over there. Real estate in India actually hasn't had any correction whatsoever in the financial crisis or post that. Sales volume stagnated but prices have been flat to slightly downward to slightly upwards. It's not that there has been any correction and there's huge amount of oversupply. So I wouldn't go around chasing uh, Indian real estate especially because the rental yields on a lot of real estate in India is actually lower than rental yields in some of the developed countries. So, which is a anomaly. So, uh, rental yield on residential real estate in Mumbai, for example, will be 2.5%, which looking at our interest rates is nothing. Yeah. And uh, it's... Would be a lower pricing. Yes. Considering the amount of capital that is input to our country, would this fixed income rate also drop? They should drop in a big way. Uh, what has been keeping them somewhat higher is that uh, at one level small savings rate have not really corrected in a big way. 
So till small saving rates come down, banks can't cut their deposit rates too much. And also, uh, consumer price inflation has not really come down for whatever reason, whether we uh, call a monsoon failure last year and agri-based inflation or uh, services based inflation or for whatever reason we haven't seen a big fall in consumer price index despite the commodity led inflation being uh, zero or negative or slightly positive kind of thing so uh, I think going forward you could see yields coming down given the way things are uh, the flows are simply overwhelming so uh, SEBI and RBI have been cautious in terms of allowing money to come in freely. They keep putting in limits, they auction the limits periodically and say you can buy only so much of government bonds, so much of corporate bonds and so on. If they open the doors wide open and suddenly India takes a fancy then we could drown in money. So the size of the money is so huge globally. So, one can make a presumption that all this money which is floating around will seek positive returns. Where they will go, that answer is not known. So, a follow on bubble will come in some place. I don't know in which asset class it will inflate. That is a difficult question to answer, but people are wanting alternatives. Sure, it could go to gold, silver, whatever. So, whatever takes the fancy of people. Uh, yeah, if, uh, yeah, one thing that I think is uh, very interesting in India is the sovereign gold uh, bonds that are there. You get the gold price appreciation as well as you get the interest rates on those bonds. I think this is a unique instrument available to Indians. It's not available to global investors. I think if someone had a masala bond of this kind, that would see a flood of investments coming in. It's, a, it's something available to us only. And if one sees gold as a inflation hedge, then that interest rate that you will get is surely a positive real rate of interest. So what can trigger a crash? It can be triggered by anything. It can be triggered by a geopolitical event. It can be triggered by a butterfly flapping its wings somewhere. So we do not know what will trigger any event. How this will end? Again, if you are not confused, you haven't thought about it properly as Munger said. But I would suspect it will end only with a bout of inflation. Because these guys will not give up. Unless all these central bankers are hit hard with spiraling inflation, they will not stop playing their games. And we have seen this in the past, right? So whenever money has been extremely cheap, it has created bubbles elsewhere and then those create inflation in those asset prices. So uh, at the time of this Y2K, money kept flowing into technology kind of thing. Uh, 
2005-6 kind of thing you had the subprime mortgages and all of that so ultimately it will create asset bubbles it may not create retail inflation but ultimately it will create asset bubbles and those have to really pop and they have to learn their lessons that we can't artificially keep flooding money and create all these boom bust scenarios great thank you so much Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme related documents carefully.